Hi, my name is Sue Jeffers. Welcome to our continuing series on constitutional candidates and getting to know the candidates that you're going to be voting for come November 2nd of this year. Uh, joining us today, Chip Kravak. Welcome, pleasure to interview you today. Thanks, Sue. Appreciate so, you letting me come here today and I appreciate the interview and thanks for the opportunity. And the people are gonna just love you once they get to know you. <laughs> so let's tell them a little bit about your background. Uh, well, I'm a small town kid from Cincinnati, Ohio. Grew up in the suburbs and uh, went away to the military at 18 years old. I went to the Naval Academy. After four years of the academy, I went down to Navy flight school. I was trained to be a CH-53 Echo helicopter pilot. I was in the South China Sea operations area, bouncing off the carrier Midway. And then after that, came back to the States. I uh, was an instructor pilot down in Pensacola for fixed wing and uh, went to night school. I picked up a master's degree in education. Uh, from there, I went off active duty, went with Northwest Airlines, and when I was with Northwest Airlines, I also stayed in the reserves. I served at the Pentagon, I served at NATO, and I have served uh, as a commanding officer of a uh, carrier command here in Minneapolis that supported the USS Theodore Roosevelt. At Northwest, I've had uh, pretty extensive experience flying aircraft, everything from DC-9s to 747s, and I've been in a union for 17 years, which is a Republican, and being in a union are sometimes uh, don't really correlate, but uh, I have been, and I was, I've been on strike. I have walked more than one picket line, and, uh, but I've also felt the sting of uh, going through corporations that have been downsizing. For example, I lost uh, half my pay. I have, uh, my pension's been cut in half and frozen. And uh, so I, I have felt the sting of that too. So I'm able to relate to a lot of the concerns of the 8th District uh, because it is highly unionized. And it's so nice to see a candidate with the American flag on their <laughs> lapel, but what are, the, what are the two wings? That's an interesting story. I was at a tea party up in Duluth, and I had always wear my American flag, but in a conversation with a lot of vets that were there, one of which uh, we talked, and he found out that I was uh, airborne. I went down to airborne school down in, down in uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. And he said, where are your wings? And I said, well, I, I don't wear them. He says, wear your wings. So from now on, I've worn my wings. I, I, haven't wore, I don't wear my air assault badge, but uh, I thought that would be just a little too much to have three sets of wings on. So I wear my <laughs> Navy pilot wings and I wear my, uh, my air, airborne wings. And your American flag pin. Which and my American flag, which I always wear. Phenomenal. We have a country to save. Yes, we do. Is and that why that's you're why running? I am here, and most <laughs> definitely. And I characterize it like this. Uh, I'm second generation here in the States. Uh, my grandfather fought in World War I. He was a trench jumper. He uh, rode motorcycles over the trenches. He jumped trenches, and that's how they did communication from the forward line to, to the rear where the, uh, where the commanders were. My father was at the tail end of Korea, though he never saw action in Korea, but he was a Navy corpsman, spent all of his time, majority of his time in the Marine Corps, 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines. And uh, I remember when I was uh, in third grade, I'm watching John Wayne in the Fighting Seabees with my dad on Sunday afternoon, matinees. And I said, Dad, I want to go in the Navy just like you. And he said, well, son, if you go, go as an officer. I said, okay, how do you do that? And, I said, and he told me, he says, there's one way that I know that's the best way, go to the United States Naval Academy. And that's what I did. Set my sights when I was in third grade. <laughs> Phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. And I, the military has been a great career for me. Uh, I, like I said, I'm a small town kid. Um, they gave me a great education. They taught me how to fly some of the most sophisticated aircraft in the world. Um, gave me a, a, a lifetime of loving aviation, and uh, brought me here. Phenomenal. So what was the tipping point? What was the thing that finally it went off in your head and you said, I have to run against Jim Oberstar, why? After I retired out of the military, um, the military kind of swallow your politics, and you complete the mission. Um, after I retired in 2005, I became a little more active. And I wrote my congressman quite a bit, which was Congressman Opestar. And I was getting a lot of letters back that were just not answering my questions. They were uh, dancing around the issues. And uh, I became very frustrated. Really long form letters, like all the rest of us get back? As a matter of fact, it's kind of interesting. My neighbor across the street, he would write a letter to completely different issues on the same topic. But we would compare the, the form letters. <laughs> They'd be the same. <laughs> so uh, what happened was I'm driving my car and uh, I heard on the radio about a Tea Party Day where we were going to go into our representative offices and present a letter requesting a formal town hall meeting discussing the original health care bill. And I said, boy, that makes sense. So 
I wrote a letter requesting a formal town hall meeting. I went to Congressman Ovestar's office up in North Branch. And after two and a half hours later, finally the staffer said, unfortunately, the congressman is too busy to meet with you. Hmm. Okay, you walk away and you say, well, that's pretty frustrating. Here we are, we have 20 constituents in here requesting a formal town hall meeting and we're told that he's too busy. Well, last time I checked, Congressman Opestar works for us. Right. So uh, I went away pretty dejected. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lobby as hard as I can, whoever is going to run against Jim Obastar, and I am going to get on their team and we're going to press forward. And there were actually quite a few people who were interested are, in challenging Jim Oberstar. When but I jumped you, in, there was uh, three other people. And you won the endorsement. I did. Yep. And uh, well, what happened was after that, uh, I read in our local paper that Jim Oberstar did come into town, met with special interest groups, but he didn't meet with his constituents. Well, that fueled my fire. And I said, I'm running against this guy. I'm going to take him head on. And that's why I'm here. So glad. We have a lot of great congressional candidates all across we the do. state of Minnesota this time. We're lucky. Uh, thank you for stepping up. It's an honor. It's a privilege. And uh, thank God it's the United States of America. <laughs> exactly. So uh, Jim Oberstar has been in office for 30. 100 years. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> 30 years now. Uh, 35 years plus he was an EA to Congressman Blatnick for 12 years prior to that. So he has been a truly a bureaucrat for all of his life. For all of his d adult life, he has been a bureaucrat. And recently, he's been contributing to the problem of the ever-growing size and expense of government. Mm -hmm. um, and what th there are so many things to be concerned about now, whether it's the deficit or the spending or the Obamacare, the new health care legislation or the cap and trade or the amnesty or any yeah. of it. Um, would you say there's one in particular that, that concerns you? They all concern me, but what we have to... But what really concerns me is this. You're kind of a, we kind of stay in the weeds by taking a look at each one of these bills individually. Pop up to 30,000 feet and let's take a look down. What does the cap and trade... You sound like such a pilot. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, you have to take a look at cap and trade. You take a look at the health care bill. And now most recently, Congressman Obistar's uh, clean water bill. What, what is the underlying theme of all these three bills. It's control. It's federal control over private citizens and private industry. That is the underlying theme here. And that is one of the major things that I got involved with because it is in direct violation of the Constitution of the 10th Amendment. And they try to use Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution using the Commerce Clause. And that has been really, really stretched especially in this latest water bill that Congressman uh, Obistar has just initiated. That is, and that's his baby. That's his pet. That He's been working baby. on this since 1973. 1972, actually, 72. When, when Congressman Blatnick put this out, uh, it's, it was challenged immediately uh, regarding the term navigable waters, what exactly is navigable waters. And if you take a look at some of the congressional history, Navigable waters back then uh, were waters that would be used for commerce, and, but they wanted to stretch it out a little bit, and rightfully so to some degree, into um, you know, tributaries that linked up to a land commerce point. That's how the bill became a little bit stretched out when, the, when navigable waters came in there. Well, the EPA kind of stretched it out even further, and in 1986, they used a theory of the migratory bird. And what they said was, if a migratory bird can see it and light upon it and land upon it, then it's under the jurisdiction of the EPA, or the Army Corps of Engineers. Well, that actually went to court after several years. Good. Uh, to be, right, exactly, because that was a definitely a stretch.